So, welcome everybody. This talk is entitled uh, Geometric Algebra in Two Dimensions Hyphen Complex Numbers Without the Square Root of Minus One. Um, it's a, possibly a marketing device to use those precise words and might be a little strong. Um, but I hope um, to get sort of pretty close um, to convincing you that um, that the mystery of that object isn't necessarily um, necessary or useful, particularly in the educational journey uh, for like high school students, I guess, typically when they um, encounter it, when we encounter it. So a bit of background. Um, I, um, I'm not a mathematician. I'm not a uh, algebraic geometer um, or geometer even, other than sort of by uh, th through my, my historical physics needs. Um, you know, so, oh, music, uh, music stopped but you can still hear me right sound is still here yes okay thumbs up good okay so you you won't be this is not a uh, dry rigor i'm not going to be saying um kind of open sets a lot or, or at all really um nevertheless i hope it's going to be a um a sort of useful, practical, um, maybe entertaining um, re-examination of something that um, you all uh, probably take for granted these days. And in a way, it's just a rehashing of part of a paper called um, Imaginary Numbers Are Not Real by uh, Gull, Doran and Lazenby. Um, and that paper serves a similar purpose. It's a kind of invitation to geometric algebra. Um, and I'm also drawing from a book called Geometric Algebra for Physicists by Doran and Lazenby. And Anthony Lazenby was my PhD advisor, uh, which is um, how I kind of got into this in the first place. Um, and it was quite useful to me um, uh, during my PhD. And so the plan is to basically kind of teach you um, geometric algebra um, in uh, sort of two or three two or three blackboards um, and in the next sort of five uh, to ten minutes and then um, look at complex numbers um, side by side with the geometric algebra of the plane and um, examine one with the other. Um, I might um, sort of rant a little bit or, or start sermonizing uh, or oversharing somehow um, on the topic of the square root of minus one. Um, so we'll, we'll get there. Um, and then, depending on how the time goes, we'll either just look at complex conjugates or possibly, maybe, but probably not, as I write, as I wrote there, um, get into um, rotations in some detail. So again, very foundational kind of um, things which we understand already. You know, so so why bother? Um, in in a sense, um, but sort of stick stick with me, and um, I hope uh, it's going to be worthwhile for you. Okay, so I started uh, with the um, the crash course on the next board, just writing it up for a bit of um, uh, speed, and. I'm entering, I have to warn you, I'm, I'm in, in the, on this board, um, I am not telling you things that I know very well or historically sort of studied. Um, it was really quite kind of practical, uh, my use of geometric algebra in the past. But I understand that uh, geometric algebra is a special case of Clifford algebras, which um, are kind of very general notion and rely on a vector space, V, over some field, K, equipped with some quadratic form, right, which maps two vectors in the space to um, an element of 
um, that field. And you can consider, you can construct, you know, and study um, Clifford algebras over any field, um, including the complex numbers. Um, but geometric algebra arises in the special case of um, the field being the real numbers. And um, we write Q as the metric G uh, with a particular signature, right? P, Q. So that's P pluses and Q minuses along the diagonal of the metric in diagonal, diagonalized form. And so then in terms of, um, you know, some notation, um, G of P and Q here uh, is what is how we'll denote the geometric algebra uh, with that signature. And in fact, we're only going to consider G of two and zero. Um, in other words, the geometric algebra in um, of the plane in two dimensions, Euclidean plane. And maybe uh, G of three and zero um, and G of n and zero um, in, in our conversation. So, in contrast to the imaginary numbers are not real paper, because you people are all proper mathematicians, I'm going to try to give you some axioms and start from there. So the first one, uh, A1, is closure. So, and these are axioms for a new um, product between elements of this vector space. Right, so A and B are both vectors. And AB is how we write this new product, which we'll call the geometric product. And we require that it is in the algebra. A2 is uh, the existence of an identity. Right, so there is a an identity uh, in G, P, and Q um, such that when geometric producted, in, the, in other words, multiplied um, on the left or the right by any vector, you just get that vector. The third one is associativity so that we all know what that is probably the order of applying the product uh, doesn't matter the fourth it's going to be distributed so that this is true, uh, not quite, this is true, and these are all boring. Uh, they're boring axioms in the sense that um, like pretty much all of the um, kind of algebras that we're used to dealing with, all of the um, the mathematical objects that we, we work with typically tend to obey these. The interesting one is um, there isn't a single word. Maybe it's the relationship with the inner product. A dot B. In other words, the operation of the metric or the quadratic form. Okay, and and this axiom says that the the geometric product of any vector with itself is um, 
equal to the inner product with itself and therefore in the field over which the vector space is defined. And I claim this is interesting because of some consequences um, that I hope to show you on the next board. Okay. Uh, I went too far, didn't I? Right, there we go. So if the, um, the geometric product of any vector with itself is a scalar, right, it's a, a real number, then I can take the inner product of A plus B with itself. And by distributivity, I get A squared plus AB plus BA plus B squared. Right, so there's no commu uh, commutativity axiom on the previous board. Uh, vectors don't necessarily commute in this algebra, hence those two middle terms kept separate. So now I can put the things which are um, scalars on the right-hand side. And Sorry to the... interrupt, Russell. Can you maybe just yeah. take one step backwards? You're in the orb camp currently. Sorry. Yep, awesome, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so I'm gonna put the things which are scalars on the right-hand side and the things which aren't necessarily, um, well, which uh, our axioms don't immediately imply are scalars on the left-hand side. Okay, so what's on the left-hand side is twice the symmetric part of the geometric product of A and B. So I'd like to give that a name. Uh, or, or a, some notation. The symmetric part of the geometric product of A and B is just A dot B, the inner product between those two vectors. And that begs the question, what about the um, anti-symmetric part of the geometric product? Well, let's give that some notation as well. We'll denote that with a wedge. This may evoke um, memories of uh, differential forms. Um, we call uh, this the exterior product. And just to be clear, you know that this definition of A dot B agrees with uh, the inner product as already defined uh, for vectors in V because of the standard identities for the dot product that says the right hand side is is uh, is uh, I mean you're you're making a definition but that notation already has a meaning for some of the possible values of A and B but you know that it agrees with the original definition in the cases where there's a potential confusion. Oh, I guess you haven't really said here that, uh, I mean, it's true that the vectors in V can be interpreted as elements of the Clifford algebra, but that's uh, it's not in your axiom somehow, right? I mean, when you write A dot A in R, like, how is R inside your Clifford algebra? I guess that's... Uh, yeah. Um... The, yeah. Sorry, the, I mean, A and B are in V, 
a b is not in v mm. but it is in g of p and q yeah and for um i guess if the algebra is to be closed the geometric product of anything um well sorry of 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 two vectors uh must be i mean by axiom 1 it's in it's in g um and then on you know and so the sum of the geometric product of two vectors like ab plus ba must also be in the g, in g whatever g is and so i think we're just kind of learning that g um is a graded algebra it's this kind of um more complicated heterogeneous thing with objects of different um well as it's called in the vernacular grade i mean maybe maybe um axiom 1 together with axiom 5 does imply that r is in g there's a subset of g mm. yeah i think there need to be some a zeros here somewhere but uh, i think that's probably belongs to the subset of things mathematicians care about that maybe aren't important for this talk so i think it's fine yeah that's right let's throw caution to the wind and um uh have some fun <laughs> um so if the two equations on the right hand side of the board are true then i can write a b equals a dot b plus a wedge b and we know uh, that you know this is a it's a scalar it's in r um, we say it's grade zero and a and b are both grade one and a wedge b turns out to be um well not turns out to be is called a uh, grade a grade two object in the vernacular it's called a bivector and it's you know so let's um interpret it now one interpretation or one way to interpret it comes from um looking at its uh, magnitude and we can calculate its magnitude as follows a wedge b geometric producted as in multiplied by itself well there's a bit of a trick here um, but if you play around with this stuff enough or even a little these tricks sort of emerge um, i'm going to use the anti-symmetry of the um the exterior product to write the exterior product between a and b in two in these two different ways right so the first one just follows directly from uh, from over here um, and if I uh, write down the, the equivalent formula for BA I get BA equals B dot A which is the same as A dot B um, plus um, B wedge A which is the same as minus A wedge B uh, which gives me uh, the second term there I'm just going to give myself a little more space. So um, the sorry, one moment. Yeah. So 
the first and the last term gives me a b b a with a minus sign minus minus abba and the inner term gives me minus a dot b squared and then i have a an a dot b factor a scalar factor which commutes with everything um, into um, a b uh, plus b a Um, that's right, because the two minus signs give me a plus sign. And that b squared, sorry, that b times b gives me b squared, which is a scalar, which I can move outside, giving me uh, minus a squared b squared. Um, this thing is two a dot b because it's the symmetric it's twice the symmetric part uh, of the geometric product and so i've got two a dot b squared minus one of them giving me plus a dot b all squared and if i just use my um, regular old knowledge of the definition of um, the scalar product in a product between two vectors, then I get a squared b squared minus a squared b squared into one uh, minus cos squared theta, which is minus a squared b squared sine squared theta, right? So this has the same magnitude as the vector or cross product between two vectors, but it's anti-symmetric. And the geometrical interpretation of what we have here is that, you know, the bivector A wedge B um, defines an oriented um, area or plane, plane area. All right, so the magnitude of the area is the area of the parallelogram defined by A and B, and it knows which way it's facing in space, so that when you change its handedness and consider B wedge A instead, the sign changes. Just comment that uh, A5 is valid for vectors in V only, right? Otherwise, it's a bit confusing because you just squared A wedge B and you got something negative, uh, whereas A squared in axiom 5, of course, has to be positive. Um, the, the, yep. the, there's no issue there because the things that A5 applies to does not include things like A wedge B. That's right. So A A five applies for vectors only. Yeah. Yeah, and and we've just taken the geometric product of a bivector with itself, which and you can start to see complex numbers emerge because we've got a minus sign up front. Okay, so we we note the similarity to the cross product, the vector product in three dimensions, but of course, you that only exists in three dimensions. Uh, it is the, the vector perpendicular to the plane in which the two uh, multiplans, I suppose, <laughs> the two vectors in the cross product um, define. Uh, and so the more fundamental object is the plane itself. Right? So maybe it seems like quibbling, uh, but it's a, it has some consequences um, later on. So... Let me or move the oil come over here and get out of its way. Okay. So, um, just to finally note, and I wish this was on the other board, 
um, but oh well. For vectors a1, a2, dot, 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 a, r, the exterior product of all of these is defined as the fully anti-symmetrized Uh, so minus one to the epsilon, where epsilon is plus one for even permutations. It's minus one for odd permutations of a um, uh, k one a k two dot 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 a k r. Right. So all. Um, all, all, um, uh, yeah, all permutations of um, a one through r, and th this this allows, uh, you know, um, well, th this is how we go up to higher dimensions, all right? So the a one, a two, a three version of this would be the volume of the parallel parallelepiped uh, defined by the three vectors a one, two, three, um, and so on. So, particularly given the time, let's get to, um, well, uh, a kind of, uh, let's, let's um, in a time boxed manner, uh, I think it is useful just to build a little bit of fluency, right? So let's write out the multi-vector A which is a naught. Sorry, this is an unfortunate notation now. A1, uh, A2, of the AR are elements of the vector space. But here, I'm going to use the same. Oh, this is even more reason why this should have been on the previous board. Oh, well, I'm going to use um, a1, uh, the, the a's denote uh, scalar multiples, so I'll get there in a second. a2, e2, plus a3 now, e1, wedge, e2. For a0, a1, a2, a3, all in r, and e1 and e2, um, form an orthonormal basis, an orthonormal ba basis, right? So e1 squared equals e2 squared equals 1, and e1 dot e2 equals 0. And then if I have a, another multivector b, which is similarly defined, then a, b, I think there's a did you say that v was two-dimensional earlier? I guess you want it to be for the geometric part of geometric algebra, but I missed it if you did say that. No, I didn't say that it was, and it isn't in general. It isn't, it isn't above this line, but it is now, and I didn't state that, for which I okay. apologize. An orthonormal basis for, um, yeah, uh, a 2D vector space. So now this is, you know, this, this is um, zero. Now. Okay. So maybe in fact, I will, I, I should write this out properly, just so we can keep track of what's going on. Okay, A0, B0 is a scalar. A1, B1 is a scalar because E1 squared is one. Um, same for A2, B2. And we're gonna have an A3, B3 scalar term. Now, what we get from multiplying the last two terms together is a3 
E1, wedge E2, B3, E1, wedge E2. And because of this, only the um, anti-symmetric part of the geometric product um, uh, is non-zero. Scalars commute with everything, so that I can move the B3 out. Then I have E1, E2, E1, E2. And in order to flip the direction, sorry, flip the orientation of these and have instead E1, E1, E2, E2, because of the anti-commutation, I have a minus sign. And then that's one, and then that's one. And so there's a minus sign here. And that's the grade zero term. Now I'm going to get a grade one term from A zero B one. Um, so this is now the E one coefficient. Right, so A0, B1, uh, B0, A1 gives me that. Also, A3, B2, um, because now A3, E1, E2, uh, B2, E2, this goes out front because it's a scalar. E2 squared is one, which gives me an E1. And in the, I, I do have some notes, which I'll post um, after this with the full completion of this, but just for, you know, for, for the sake of time, I'm gonna say that there are four terms here. Uh, in each scalar coefficient and I guess I'll write the wedge just to emphasize the similarity in form of the answer, uh, big A, big B, um, you know, living in the same, uh, uh, being expressed on the same multi-vector basis as the original big A and the original big B. Okay, so, um, that's that's not I mean in practice you tend not to write um, everything out in components like this um, computer algebra systems will uh, and do it for you under the hood uh, but I think it's kind of useful just to build a bit of fluency um, like we did in the blue um, with the um, anti commutation okay so the crash course is complete maybe are there any questions before we go over to the next set of boards and uh, compare with complex numbers. I have a question. So you multiply two vectors, you get a bivector. You multiply two bivectors, you get a scalar. Why should I expect to get a scalar and not a vector or another bivector? I multiply two vectors and I get um, not only a bi only I only get a pure bivector if they are orthogonal. So if the scalar part vanishes, if the inner product part vanishes. Oh right, yeah. Sorry. Uh, this from here. Right, and then so why do two bivectors go to a scalar? Well, I didn't. So I I. I I multiplied those two, so two bivectors, uh, two different bivectors don't necessarily give only a scalar. Oh, I see. Um, but I, I multiplied a bivector by itself, and I used only the rules of the axioms and maybe some other kind of basic stuff like the geometrical kind of interpretation of the inner product that we kind of take for granted, and that I maybe didn't include in the axioms on account of my uh, non-rigorous mathematicalness. So I think, you know, on the left, on the on the board, um, on the, the, sec the penultimate board, uh, that manipulation...
Oh. Sorry, click the wrong button. Hopefully I'm back. Bob Cam. Yeah, so on um you know on, on the penultimate board, that manipulation, um you know, why did we get a scalar at the end? Well, um I guess because of where we started plus the axioms of geometric algebra, right? Because we didn't use anything beyond what we already knew from previous boards. Okay, thank you. No problem, thanks for the question. Okay, so, that's good. So now, complex numbers. So, as we know, a complex number Z has a real part and an imaginary part. And as such, we can think of it as representing a point in the complex plane. So it's, you know, it's like um, a position vector. But, you know, here's how we would represent um, a position vector in a two-dimensional vector space in geometric algebra. We've got our basis vectors. We might have an x component multiplying the first one. We might have a y component multiplying the second one, and we might give it a name, v. So this is already, I mean, maybe not um, a big deal, again, to us sort of complex number um, connoisseurs, uh, but I would, I think you could argue that it's sort of more straightforward to represent vectors with vectors than with anything else. Now, let me pre-multiply W by the real axis, as it were, this um, first basis vector. Right, so X is a scalar, comes out front, E1 squared is one, and y, uh, it can move through y, and we get e1, e2, which by the orth orthogonality of e1 and e2 is the same as e1 wedge e2. And I'm just going to call that i, but capital I now. And we know that the geometric product of i with itself is minus one from the a wedge b squared manipulation because theta is pi on two and the length of a and the length of b here the length of e1 and e2 uh, is both one so we kind of have the square root of minus one i mean of course whatever i say here is going to be kind of isomorphic to complex numbers. But this is all about the interpretation, like how we think about it, um, particularly geometrically. Um, we can also, by the way, just sort of check E1, E2, E1, E2, which is minus E1, E1, E2, E2. If I just switch those around, which is minus one. So let's call this Z, big Z, right? So this big Z is a multi-vector. It has a scalar part, a grade zero part, and it has a bivector grade two part. And 
you know, this is clearly, um, I'm going to put a complex number in quotes, because it's the fundamental object in complex um, arithmetic. And of course, this is the fundamental object um, in geometry. And, and notice it's, it's independent of any choice of basis, right? It's just uh, like this is a geometrical uh, object. It's, it's where this is relative to this. You know, and, and what we're doing here is uh, kind of picking a special direction for the real axis. But the, the interesting thing is that co complex numbers don't only encode positions of points in the plane. Like there must be some reason for us to bother with them in the first place. And that reason is that they also encode transformations in the complex plane. And in the geometric algebra version of this, the position vectors are encoded by vectors, but the transformations are encoded by, it turns out, even grade multivectors. And so now it's um, maybe time to rant. Um, or, or maybe just share and maybe overshare, I don't know. You know, high school kids, typically, myself included, have, you know, get presented with this story that there's, you know, we, that there is no real number, or there's no number, you can't take the square root of minus one, is, is what we're told. Right, we, we know that because we learn the rules of, the, of arithmetic. But, you know, equations where squares take negative values do arise in many problems. So let's give the square root of minus one some notation and work with it. But we don't know what it is. It's a big mystery. And then little z is a point in the plane. And now we can solve some problems that we couldn't um, with pure sort of existing vector analysis. But I think a, a better story, potentially, is that the vector analysis that we want to use is incomplete uh, because it doesn't have quite the right definitions of products of vectors. And if you instead, you know, imagine a world where um, in school, everybody learned um, the geometric product as I um, have presented it here. Then um, we would have the natural interpretation of, of I as the complex plane itself, right? Embedded perhaps in some other space, right? I mean, you could add an E3 and then you've got three so-called complex planes, right? E1, E2. E2, E3, and E1, E3. And they know which way they're facing, so that E1, E2 is, is um, you know, the opposite direction to E2, E1. And when we want to rotate, for example, oh, let's try that again, I'll go white. So there's E1, there's E2. You know, the, the impact of multiplying by I, we know, rotates by, by my, uh, 90 degrees, pi on 2. Okay, so I've, I've moved E2 either forward past the right hand E1 or backward past the left and E1, so I get a minus sign, you know, and so now I have minus E2, right? So left multiplying by I uh, gives you a left-handed rotation. 
Um, and similarly, it turns out that, um, sorry, that's a one, that's a two. So this was I E1, and this is E1 I. Right multiplying by I gives you a, a right-handed rotation. And, you know, so, so therefore, clearly, rotating twice gives you a 180-degree rotation, which, again, we, we have that interpretation from complex analysis. Um, this is nothing new, but there's no, uh, there's no mystery. There's no strange uh, mystique, um, which, I don't know, we can discuss. It's kind of cool. It makes math, math kind of mysterious and wonderful, but also perhaps a little inaccessible um, for many people. So I'm looking at the time. Um, there is a cool story about complex conjugation and reflection, uh, which I could continue with, uh, but I think I'm just going to pause and see if we want to um, ponder, discuss, answer any questions, ask any questions. I mean, I finished my rant. Yeah. <laughs> Good rant. Any questions for Russell while we, before we go on? Yeah, you said you learned geometric algebra out of necessity, or I think you said something along those lines. What do you use it for? So I, um, I learned it um, uh, from, like, I, I mean, I, I, so the three people um, I named in the references, uh, Steve Gull, Anthony Lazenby, and Chris Doran, they were all in the same, all in <clears throat> the same group um, when I was uh, studying um, for my PhD, when I was working um, there. And so I was kind of immersed in it. And it was the natural language um, in which to do general relativity at the time. I was trying to measure how fast uh, certain black holes were spinning based on their X-ray spectra, uh, simulating their GOD6, uh, the, the photon trajectories nearby, you know, all those, um, the, the pictures which are now, well, even there are photographs, um, you know, or, or a photograph, right, in recent years um, of the very same thing, that kind of characteristic accretion disk type um, shape that you see. So you can do GR, um, you can do, um, I, what they argue is that it's the most natural language for physics in general. Um, so lots of things arise quite naturally um, from spinners to even complex analysis, right? Because the, if you define a vector derivative and apply it using a geometric product, you can invert it. And it turns out that uh, the Cauchy um, integral formula um, has a nice interpretation as um, the, the green function um, for that vector derivative in 2D, which is a special case of Stokes' theorem and the divergence theorem and, and Green's theorem, which are all kind of uni unified into a single theorem that um, is called the fundamental theorem of geometric calculus, I believe, in their book, or maybe in um, other books preceding it. Um, and then a fun thing that I did, uh, kind of recreationally, was um, analyze the uh, geometry of a sundial, um, but incorporating like all the rotations from like the tilt of the Earth's axis to the um, uh, uh, the um, orbit of the Earth around the Sun and the spinning of the Earth itself, and so on and so forth. Just just as a kind of almost a pedagogical exercise. Um, but it turns out that rotations, uh, I mean, the, the, the rotations are encoded quite nicely in, uh, in this stuff. Um, in fact, in the way we're used to using complex numbers, like, you know, cos theta plus I sine theta, you know, Euler's identity, in the complex plane, 
generalizes to any plane in space. And you can just kind of think of rotations in that way, almost. Um, but that's, a, that's maybe a story for another time. Um, anyway, so, so that's, um, that's how I've used geometric algebra in the past. Did you want to do reflections? Uh, how long yeah, will that take? Let's, let's do, um, I, I think it should be um, within the time. I appreciate this is the end of your morning, uh, so there might be some fatigue. No, no fatigue. Let's do it. Uh, yeah, I, I love this calculation. <laughs> this is my favorite thing to do when showing Clifford algebras to somebody. Conjugates. So complex conjugates uh, and reflections. Okay, so we know, I mean, I wonder what we do first. Let's do reflections first, and then um, we'll get to complex conjugates, which we know, of course, are just a reflection in the real axis of any complex number. So I would like to define a, oh no, a unit vector n which g given that we sort of live somewhat in 3d maybe i will draw the plane that it's perpendicular to and take an arbitrary vector a and reflect that along the unit vector That will be a prime. And in order to do that, I'd like to resolve this vector into two components. One is going to be parallel to n, not the plane. And the other is going to be perpendicular to the plane. So here is the trick kind of almost version of, of this. Sorry. Uh, maybe I will not factor that out. I'll write it like this. Where that is a parallel and that is a perpendicular. So there's a convention going on here that we do this first and then this geometric product second. And I think it's not all that obvious that like, like we know that, um, I mean, from our, you know, just uh, we, we know that that a dot n times n or n dot a times n, same thing, is the comp is is a parallel. I think um, that's pretty intuitive. Um, it's less intuitive that n uh, times n wedge a is the other component uh but we can but you just prove that, that. Well. sorry I and mean, this cal this calculation is the proof right because uh, rearranging you get a minus a parallel is equal to that second term on the right hand side so this calculation has proven both that, that second term is in fact a vector and not a bivector uh -huh. or a multi-vector and has proven that it is the orthogonal part because we know that difference is the orthogonal part. Yes, okay, yes, that's right. Um, yeah, so, so A, let me um, maybe change color. A perpendicular 
you know, so so this um, is um, is a minus a parallel a minus uh, a dot n times n. Um, but from from the second term, we can we can we can say a sorry n n wedge a. So uh, you're absolutely right. Um, I'm going to use some brute force here um, so I can see it on the page and um, my little brain can um, make it more obvious, right? So I can I can express the uh, wedge as the geometric product minus the um, scalar product. Well, and then because n squared is 1, uh, the first term gives me, the first term here gives me the first term uh, from up top, and I have, and the commutation of scalars with vectors gives me the second term. Okay, so we're halfway there. Now we can exp uh, express the reflected vector, a prime, as, well, we need to um, we need to go along here and then down there, right? So that's a perpendicular uh, minus a parallel, which is n n wedge a minus n n dot a. So I can pull a minus n out. Uh, and then I need to flip the direction of this anti-commuting product. And I can flip the direction of the commuting product without changing any sign. And of course, what's in the brackets is just the geometric product. So we have a nice, neat, compact um, expression for reflections. And I'll just do a little quick, by the way, um, a rotation, and any rotation can be expressed as two reflections. Right, so this R, which is the geometric product of two um, uh, unit vectors, but not necessarily orthogonal, uh, orthonormal vectors. Um, so this is a, a complex number, by the way, right? It's an even grade um, multivector in 2D, um, is something called a rotor. And um, this tilde notation uh, is the reverse, which just means um, change the order of all, uh, reverse the order of all geometric products. Um, and that's, that's kind of how rotations look. But that's not uh, what I need to say right now, because we're running out of time. And I've got um, a complex conjugate to make contact with. Okay, so z star, so little z star, right? So z is my complex number, is of course... I think you might have to move over slightly to get the camera onto that board. Sorry. I yep. do indeed. That's cool. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, that's the complex conjugate of z. In our um, big z uh, world, z, well... Um, what does it look like in the big Z world? Well, x minus i y, uh, which is x minus e1, e2, y, which is, well, our vector w. Let me just factor that out.
it's the reverse operation because z, if you remember, was formed by pre-multiplying our position vector by the real axis. Now, if I just apply reflection directly to w, well, I want to reflect along the E2 axis. So that's minus E2 W uh, E2, right? And again, by a quick manipulation, uh, we get minus X E2 E1 E2, that's the first term, minus Y E2 E2 E2, right? So that is one that changes the sign once we kill those and we get um, x e1 minus y e2 as we expect. So complex conjugation and reflection in the um, or along the imaginary axis or the e2 axis um, are consistent with each other. And again, there's this theme of, um, well, what is complex conjugation? There's some mystery there, it's new words. Um, maybe they're all, they're, they aren't all completely necessary. Amen. <laughs> Yeah, can I invite you to have a rant about uh, what's better about geometric algebra than uh, compared to the cross product? Why we have it? We have an operation of multiplication. Why? Why do we need some other thing? Yeah, you don't. Um, cross products give you axial vectors as opposed to polar vectors, uh, which behave differently under reflections. Um, but that distinction, that's another way of saying bivectors versus vectors. Um, the cross mm. product only exists in three dimensions. Um, right, yeah. Bivectors ex exist in all dimensions. And, you know, there are, there are six of them in space-time, you know, adding the fourth direction in, available direction. Mm. Uh, and so I think the cross product is kind of um, a historical accident and an accident of us happen, happening to inhabit three spatial dimensions that we're aware of. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's funny how a little known geometric algebra is compared to the cross product, I guess, because of the way we teach. I mean, once you go past undergraduate, uh, I guess most physicists will learn about spinners and uh, many mathematicians will encounter Clifford algebras uh, and maybe the, the grip of the cross product on people's imagination kind of decreases but when you're an undergraduate it seems like a really fundamental thing somehow um, of course it is a real thing uh, you know it's got to do with the Lie algebra of, of rotations in three dimensions it's not it's not like it's a bad idea but yep yeah it's much more general to to geometric algebra yeah so I, I don't know it's uh, I don't um, I, I'm not going to die on the hill of <laughs> um, sort of crusading the world, uh, changing the way it's taught uh, necessarily. Um, I, I don't actually know whether there's like if if we you know if we paid the cost of rewriting every of re-educating every educator uh, mm -hmm. and rewriting all the books and all speaking geometric algebra, um, would that pay a dividend in terms of advancing? Uh, fundamental physics, theoretical physics, or any other mm. field. Uh, I, I don't. I don't know at this point in our story, but I do think it's a bit of a shame that um, that uh, vector analysis sort of took the turn it did with, like Hamilton, um, mm. and back in the day. I think it's interesting that. Clifford algebras and geometric algebra has uh, come back uh, in the application of machine learning. Um, so there's quite a few different groups using geometric algebra in the context of deep learning of various things. Um, 
but there, of course, you're dealing with quite high dimensional spaces, right? So you want to multiply vectors and it's not somehow tied to three dimensions. So geometric algebra is what you do. Um, I guess the applications in physics, since they are sort of heavily oriented around three dimensions, there's a good reason to maybe not move on from the cross product, but maybe the the time of the uh, the geometric product is is not yet arrived, but it's still coming. <laughs> well, maybe. Do you have a yeah. favorite text for geometric algebra? I mean, I know Hestony's work, but I'm not such a big fan of his textbooks. I actually, uh, I, I feel a bit sheepish saying this, but I, I do think um, the second reference I put on that first board uh, is a really nice book. Mm. They explain it really well. Uh, Geometric Algebra for Physicists by Doran and Lazenby. I read, I tried reading Geometric Algebra for Computer Graphics. That was a mistake. I will <laughs> check this one out. Yeah. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, any more questions for Russell? Yeah, let's give him a round of thumbs up. <laughs> much appreciated. <laughs>